going to wait on sound. Thank you. Um, so welcome everyone, and thank you for coming to today's Cosmos Science City. Uh, Cosmos Science City is a collaboration between the Royal Institution of Australia, which is the publisher of Australia's premier science magazine, Cosmos, um, the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute, and Adelaide's three main tertiary institutions, the University of Adelaide, the University of South Australia, and Flinders University. My name's Ellen Fidian. I'm a journalist here at Cosmos, and I'll be convening today's panel. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're here today on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pay respect to elders past and present. We recognize and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the living Ghana people today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations. Before we get underway, I have a few quick pieces of admin for you. Um, should anyone wish to use the bathroom, you'll find them just outside in the corridor. And in the unlikely event of an emergency, um, you'll leave this building the way you came and gather in exchange place. If any of you need assistance evacuating the building, um, let me or one of our other staff members know and we'll be assisting you. The theme of today's Science City is jobs of the future. I'd like to start this session with a video address from the Honourable Brendan O'Connor, the Federal Minister for Skills and Training, and he'll provide a bit of a launch pad for the rest of the discussion. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land you are on, the corner people, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I extend those respects to all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. And I look forward to the opportunity to recognise our First Peoples and our Constitution in less than six weeks when we all get a say in recognising and listening to our First Australians. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the skills of the future, particularly in science and technology. All of you would be familiar with the work of Carl Sagan, the astronomer, cosmologist, astrophysicist and TV host. His show was Cosmos, the namesake of the magazine and this event. Sagan's legacy includes encouraging scientists to dream and discover. Imagination, he once said, will often carry us to worlds that never were, but without it, we go nowhere. Imagination is at the heart of the jobs of the future. And while it's hard for any of us to precisely imagine what new skills are required beyond the near term, the very process of imagining is what brings those new skills about. None of you need a degree in rocket science to appreciate that far more prosaic factors are at play identifying and shaping jobs of the future. That's the matter of fact role of government to ensure that we can promote the jobs of the future. In order to do that, it's important to firstly imagine and create what we can foresee about the challenges we're facing to ensure we don't make the same mistakes and we can plan for a better and brighter future. For example, you don't need a crystal ball to know what we need more tech, what that we need more technical and scientific skills to successfully transform the economy to become net zero. Upon entry <laughs> government last year, we inherited a massive skills crisis. The current skills priority shows that the occupations in shortage nearly doubled, jumping from 153 to 286 in only a year. To put it bluntly, we're facing one of the worst skills crises in our nation's history. And if the pandemic taught us anything, is that building sovereign capability is vital. It's not a binary choice between educating and training locally or skill migration. We must do both. Looking at the top 20 occupations in demand nationally, almost half have direct FET pathways, including six occupations within the top 10. Two tech professions, including those occupations suffering skill shortages are software and application programmers and ICT business and system analysts. It's no accident that the first legislation we introduced on coming to government was to create Jobs and Schools Australia. JSA is developing tripartite partnerships with employers, unions, and education training providers to develop and provide advice on our current and emerging school needs. We're also delivering fee free tape for vet places in areas of priority, and tech sits at the vanguard of our government's jobs priorities. Every tape has seen a strong take up in technology and digital, attracting over 16,000 enrolments. 
And we are well on the way to delivering 1.2 million jobs in tech by 2030 with futures that are secure, well-paid and meaningful. But it's not just vocational training that we need to focus on. More and more, we're going to see the need for collaboration between our tertiary sectors, between vet and universities functioning together. Skills requirements for jobs are evolving. More and more, we need to higher level of skills which combine both practical and knowledge-based skill acquisition. Boosting science and tech skills is not a nice to have. It is vital to building a stronger, more competitive nation and a stronger, more secure economy with greater opportunity for all. I promise you that we'll continue to work to support Australians to dream and discover. Thanks again for inviting me to address this forum. So, um, with that in mind, we've got four researchers here to talk about the skills, research and vocations that are going to be shaping the next few decades. Um, Dr. Ruchi Sinha is an Associate Professor of Organisational Behaviour at the University of South Australia's Business School. She's passionate about translating psychological and management science research into actionable insights for leaders, employees and organisations. Her research revolves around understanding team dynamics and effectiveness, as well as negotiation success in the work context. Dr. Andrea Sabula is an associate professor in the future of work at Flinders University, um, the Australian Industrial Transformation Institute. Based at the Tonsley Innovation District, Andreas has conducted research on employment and workplace practices. Dr. Paul Wong is a senior bioinformatician at the South Australian Genomics Centre, which is in the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute, or SAMRI. Um, the South Australian Genomics Centre is a core, sequency sorry, core sequencing facility, um, providing a range of genomics and bioinformatics services. And Dr. Charlie Hargroves is a senior lecturer within the Entrepreneurship Contra Sorry. It's a big mouthful. I mean, yeah. This one is Entrepreneurship Commercialization and Innovation Center. Thank you. <laughs> At the University of Adelaide's Business School. Um, Charlie's been studying the application of blockchain technologies since 2017. Welcome once again Thank to you. all of you. Now, the bulk of this session will be open for audience questions, and I'd really love to hear some. So think on what you're going to be asking. We've also got a few that have been pre submitted. Um, but I would like to begin by letting each of the researchers kind of say their piece. And so to start with, um, Richie, I have a question for you. <laughs> I don't know this one. Okay. <laughs> what is the purpose of a job? Ooh, now this is where I have five pages of notes to go through. <laughs> a question that I did not know was coming. Um, so before I answer that question, um, I just want to share a few thoughts I have about sitting here and talking about the future. Um, I was made in India and very early I started having zero trust in astrologers or anyone who wants claim makes a claim that they know the future or can predict it. Um, and yet I'm sitting here today talking about how some of the science we do and some of the research we do would help us imagine a future that could occur. But um, I, but the one thing I know about jobs of the future are, are that they're not immutable. They're not set in stone, that things that we do today, the decisions we make in terms of what the minister said about policies, regulation, how we educate the people of today for the tomorrow is actually going to shape the future that comes to be. So having said that, um, in order to talk about what the jobs of the future could be, let's step back a little and think about what, why do we work? Why did we create this idea of jobs? And um, predominantly as a psychologist, which I am, um, we understand why humans work in job, what makes them satisfied, what makes them happy. But we also know jobs exist because they serve an economic value. That's how we divide labor in society. That's how we're able to live life where we don't have to do everything because there's someone else who's doing a job that serves us as a collective. Um, and so there are two purposes to, to having jobs is there's an economic value that jobs provide, and there's a personal value. And as a psychologist who studies the personal value, we know that we like to work in jobs that give us meaning, they give us a sense of identity, they give us a sense of significance, they are a huge source of our livelihood. That's how we live what we want out of our lives. Um, and having put all of this in that to purpose, um, if I can transition into sort of my, my four minutes on the stage, 
is what do I think are the jobs of the future? They will have to serve both the purposes because you need to create productive economic value. It needs to serve a purpose in society uh, where things need to get done, but it also needs to serve the purpose of the human need for meaning, significance, and identity. And I think technology and a lot of the AI and, and disruptions will happen on both sides. They will also disrupt what meaning of worth is for us as humans, and they're going to disrupt the kind of economic value that is um, valued or desired. So um, if I were to just think about how would I come about predicting what jobs the future is, we need to think about what we do now, why we do it, how much of what we do, and what are the skills we currently use. So when I was thinking about it, um, a lot of the literature on work and jobs divides like these blue collar, white collar, you know, people who do things with their hands, they physically manipulate the environment in which they work. And, and the so-called white collar are people who are processing information. They're making decisions around ideas, which eventually could have real world physical consequences. Um, and for the longest time, the biggest threat has been that robots and machines are going to replace humans in the manufacturing physical side, which has been true. Um, if you look at agriculture um, and the technology that has disrupted it, we need fewer human hands to do what we used to do earlier. You look at um, factory workers, automated manufacturing, warehouse sorting, leaner workforce, more productivity. I think that trend is going to continue. One reason why it's going to continue is not because humans are replaceable, but it's because that was the drudgery that not too many humans wanted to engage in. So there are some aspects of what we do that give us meaning, and we like to get rid of not being under the sun and working for hours on the field when we can have a machine do it. Um, and for the longest time, even mainstream media and movies would say that be like Terminator-like robots who are going to come in, you know, the AIs are going to... Uh, take over the world. And everyone who is doing these knowledge processing, information processing roles, sat on their ivory towers thinking, it's never going to come to us. Like, there's not going to be a technology that's going to replace the need for human intelligence. It's the very valued resource that gives me meaning and significance. And I think that is a false sense of safety. I do think that the future will have technology that will have intelligence which will make us question who we are as individuals and what our value to society is. So with the large language models, and tell me when I'm like going over, I'm a lecturer, I can go for three hours. <laughs> um, um, but like the technology, I, I'm an academic and I think about this every day. Like what is going to be a professor's job? I also do research, I do teaching. Um, and, and to the jobs of the future, we shouldn't be uh, complacent thinking it's only going to replace with machinery robotics. But also it's going to replace us in a lot of the things that we valued about ourselves as human intelligence, processing information, identifying pattern, making decisions from insight about those patterns in what we see. And we already know in 2023 that a machine learning algorithm can detect patterns far more quickly than a human who spent 15 years specializing in pattern detection in a narrow field. So if I were to predict what the jobs of the future are, it's definitely going to be working alongside this new intelligent entity. It doesn't have to be in the form of the human robot or human looking robot, but an intelligent entity that we thought could not surpass our intelligence, which most likely will, is my view. But if it does, then what's, what's going to be left for us to do is one of the other questions. And I think there is still a decent amount of things left for us to do. And I've made some um, future cheeky job titles, which I'll I'll, I'll say a little bit later, maybe, but one of the things I know we will still be needed for is making sense of what the output of this intelligent entity is. Now, what does making sense mean is, is data is obviously gives us insights, but those insights don't tell us how to make decisions on those insights. And that's where the human intelligence is going to be important. And that is going to be important both for blue collar and white collar jobs, because when you have robots, machines taking over, um, let's say, um, manufacturing or farming or other sort of, tech, um, you know, physical acts, you will still need to have a supervisor. You'll still have to have a person who integrates the insights from these machines. And um, the last thing I would say is that when you 
when you ask yourself, if that is the skill, making sense is the skill that future jobs are going to require, then is that a job of a specialist or is that a job of a generalist? Any guesses? Which one would you go for? You think future human okay. intelligence? I have an answer on the stage. Generalist? A team that involves both of them. Uh, both of them. All right. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm going to defer from that a little bit um, and just say that I think from what I understand about how technology learns, that they're always going to be better on narrow skills. So there's going to be likely in the near future, at least, more likely for narrow super intelligence than for general super intelligence in, let's say, the next 20, 40 years. Um, in that 20, 40 years, when you have, you work alongside a narrow intelligence that supersedes your intelligence, then it's the generalist ability to take insights from many narrow intelligence sources to make an overarching decision. So I see jobs of the future. I see education for jobs of the future to make you far more well-read across disciplines rather than within a single discipline. Because I'm not saying there's zero depth because there is depth enough, but you rely on a, another narrow intelligence to gain that depth. So I'm going to stop at that and maybe come back later. It's actually really quite interesting. It's very par in parallel to the Renaissance where they decided that you know, engineers like Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, Di Da Vinci. Yeah. <laughs> DiCaprio. <laughs> was an engineer and a doctor and yeah. artist and, a, and studied multiple fields. Mm -hmm. And it's only just recently since we're fitting into the work machine yeah. that we all study one thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the ability to be a polymath. Well, possibly a little bit more on AI, but first um, on the, the need for fewer hands. Um, Andreas, how is automation going to affect our work? Um, I'm going to repeat some of the words that no. what you said. <laughs> Not exactly, but I'm making, it, making a similar point. Um, but taking a more sort of macroeconomic perspective here, um, Automation is a bit of a, of a, of a tricky thing. It's, it's actually happening all the time, but we don't necessarily can pinpoint where, where it's happening, how to de detect. Um, you can um, look at it from the point of view of, of com computers. We've been mm -hmm. having computers um, well, taking off in terms of use and, and, and the, the money we spend on computers since you know, 1995 when the, the statistics started on that. And, and we, we continue to spend more on, on computers, even though they're actually getting cheaper. So, you know, we're, we're using more of them in, in, in varieties of ways. Yet, um, nobody really talks about them anymore. You know, it's a sort of a, a given, you know, we've, we've got them. We, we, we up, upgrade ever so often. Um, yes, it's, it's a sign of, of, of automation of things that, 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 that are happening steadily, but also sporadically and in inverse. So you have, you had COVID, spending on computers just went ballistic compared to where it was, was previously. Um, but it's not just COVID, there are other things happening as well. If we look at specific industry sectors, for instance, um, retail wholesale um, was a pretty average spender when it comes came to technology up to sort of the mid of uh, the, the last decade, um, and then changed completely and became one of the big spenders on, on technology because the whole process has changed. Um, um, what, um, a, a, a retailer and a wholesaler had to offer to, to survive in the, in, the, in the marketplace. So the, 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 the business um, model changed uh, also with, with online uh, competition arriving. Robots, um, another, another technology that took off roughly from um, the, uh, the, the middle of the last dec uh, decade as, as well. But you can only see it in manufacturing. Uh, it's it's emerging somewhere else as well, but the talk is about manufacturing, and and, and, and unlike uh, computers, we 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 talk about robots an awful lot because that's that's the, the technology that that's going to kill our jobs. Apparently, um, computers are no longer in that in that in that category. Um, the uh, but the the effect of these 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 technologies on on the different sectors have has been different as well. So what we saw in in manufacturing with robots, the kind of routine blue color jobs disappearing and proportionately more jobs um, uh, surviving or being created at the uh, more specialist, higher skill end. In retail, 
it's it's been a complete mix. It's been complicated as well because it actually, in terms of employment, retail also doubled in size in the last ten years. Um, we have twice as many people working in that sector than we had in say, 2011. Um, so there, there, there are different effects that these technologies have, and it's very difficult to generalize and say this one thing or the other thing will will happen. So we've got to be a little bit careful there. Um, another way just to look at um, how uh, automation is happening or whether it's happening is, is look at what, what businesses tell us. And it's roughly 20% of businesses who say um, that they've introduced a new process innovation in their business in the last two years. Um, and that's in the last two years because that's how these questions have been asked by, by the Australian Bureau of Statistics when they do their survey. Um, now, not every process innovation in, involves automation because it, you know, there's machinery is involved, but not necessarily. It could be just um, uh, making a hierarchical organization flatter. That would be an example of a process innovation. It doesn't necessarily imply any kind of automation, but it could, uh, could cut out uh, a, a middle group, a middle person, and in increase the efficiency, which is one of the requirements to, to uh, be classified and accepted as a, as a, as a process of innovation. Um, so again, there, 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 there are different things happening here. So what, what, what in terms of jobs in general has been happening in the last 10 or more years? What we've seen is, is uh, a, a shift from um, making and moving things to um, uh, managing and monitoring people. So what the average job looks like today and the time it's spent doing what you start, what you do in your job has changed quite quite significantly. So we're not we're not producing that much anymore than we are actually uh, arranging the production of that was then happening somewhere else. And more people are getting involved in this arrangement of, of the production. Now, the interesting thing is, and that we should refer to that, that you know, there are certain jobs that have disappeared. Um, uh, Blue color is one way to describe them, and uh, 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 others refer to them as as routine manual. And then there's there's also um, routine cognitive and various types. And but what's been happening is, and that's important in my view, is that even though these jobs have been disappearing, the people haven't disappeared. And in many many instances, what we've seen is that um, the newly emerging and the jobs be growing in quantity. Now, many of them were already around. We always had some sort of computer um, experts working somewhere, but they were a tiny group. Now, you know, many more of us are computer literate, and and many many more people work in 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 digital industries. But what's been happening is that people who were in those declining jobs actually switched into the the growing jobs. Um, and part of that is because these automation revolutions that have been happening didn't actually completely destroy an, an, um, an existing sector, and, it, and everything happened gradually. So it wasn't a big bang, if you like. Uh, in many instances, automation happened very, very gradually. And that means in a job, a person um, who would have had, walked around with a notebook at some point in time eventually got an iPad or a tablet. Um, and that changed the job because things that would have taken an awful lot of time to do in the past could have been done uh, quicker, uh, more efficiently, and you could connect to other people. Piece of paper, difficult to connect, you know, put it in an envelope, send it out by post. A tablet, email. And you connect not just only locally within your business, but, but far beyond. So these things, because they're being done incrementally, have not changed the world in such a way that we immediately notice it. So it's it's a kind of uh, slow moving uh, change. Um, now, what does it mean for future? The, the second question is about AI. Is, mm -hmm. is AI going to be different? Um, uh, the answer I give to that one is it certainly has the potential uh, for two reasons. One, it's bigger. And the other one, it, it's also smaller. Um, bigger means big data, everyone, Heard that expression. Uh, what you can do is is a much grander scale, and it's what you can do with with AI. Um, even though it's not artificial intelligence, it's probably augmented human intelligence at this point in time. Um, automation in the past would have been manufacturing motor automation. 
data analysis allows you to go into every sector. So the, 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 the impact is going to be much more diverse, spreading far wider. Um, and it's also smaller because, you know, we all got our little apps on our mobile phones. And, and, and these, of course, enter the workplace in various places as well. Um, so that makes them much more versatile, available, cheaper, uh, more choice as well, um, leading to procrastination and all sorts of things. Um, so the, the potential is there. Currently, 1% of Australian business use AI, so they tell us. Question is, is that an Australian economy that's sluggish? Or is this just a sign of you know, something big that's going to, to come in the future? I'm not going to hazard a guess here. Um, uh, there are lots of factors that will play a role in this, um, but you know the potential is there. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, so those are a couple of very big picture views. I want to get a little bit narrower now and look at a specific technology and how that might be influencing the future of some work. So, Paul, what is bioinformatics and why is it changing research? Um, so bioinformatics is a very broad field. Uh, at the core of it, basically, all it means is it's uh, it's data science applied to biological data, um, but it, it covers a lot of things. Uh, what I do is actually just a small part of it, although you, you, you do encounter quite often in medical science and in research these days. Um, and what we do is we use uh, sequencing technology. Um, and you might have heard of words like genomics and transcriptomics and things like this, like all of these omics technology. Um, and what that means is, um, like it's to do with, uh, like for, for example, for health, it often relates to the human genome or the human DNA. Uh, and um, the human DNA is about, uh, there's about 3 billion, um, it, it's like a, uh, several strings are it all together comprises about 3 billion mm -hmm. characters. Uh, and so that's a lot of information uh, to process. And before before turn of the century, before, well, turn of millennium, um, 20, 30 years ago, uh, biology and biological research and medical research um, did not work at this scale. And often uh, researchers will work on a few uh, a few genes, a few proteins um, that they uh, and and you don't really have data at this level that that you need so much computing to to work to to analyze. Um, but since the human uh, genome project that was completed around 2000, um, now you have access to this amount of data, um, and and that is becomes almost impossible to do it by hand. And so, a uh, quick way of thinking what bioinformatics does is um, anything that you can't really easily do in Excel, um, <laughs> we do that stuff. Um, and um, and and, and I, I like to think of it. It's it, uh, it's kind of a combination of several fields of, of it's multidisciplinary. Um, it's uh, uh, currently what we need. We we need like the latest in technology that include and so that will include physics, engineering, uh, and chemistry. Uh, we also need understanding of biology, um, and and we also need lots and lots of mathematics yeah. and programming. And that's not to say that I know all this stuff. I I know a little bit of everything. Um, and actually, I'll probably have less biological knowledge than most um, biology, biology students. Um, I because my background was in physics and mathematics, um, so I just learned what I need, and I forget mm -hmm. most of what I learned as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it is like for bioinformatics, it's, a, it's a kind of a combination of all these different parts together. And without any of that, uh, what we do today is not possible. Um, and so I think it kind of point towards like job in the future as in that, you know, that we are, we're starting to correlate what we have been correlating all these fields already by just, you know, it gets to a point where all of a sudden that mm -hmm. we have all these advances in technology, in computing, uh, and we're, like, we're using mathematical uh, uh, theories and, and, and solutions that, when, that didn't exist 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. like, so for, in terms of mathematics, that, that is very, very modern. Um, and same with technology, computing, I, the, we're using all these tech, latest uh, technique, mm -hmm. techniques and solutions and so on. Um, so uh, so I guess, I don't know if I'm confusing the issue even more, but what I'm trying to say is that uh, bioinformatics, it's a very loose term. There's a lot of different things. Uh, there are a lot of people working in different areas. Um, and, um, and, 
And I think that, um, you know, where you come from, because you can enter this field from any point. Uh, I have colleagues who were trained in, in, in biology. In, uh, in, in, I have colleagues who uh, used to program for financial institutes or designing computer games. Uh, and some of us, uh, actually many of us come from physics uh, where you know, funding is a bit trickier to come by. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so it, it really is like bringing lots of different skills from across all the different areas. Um, and so I think your second part was uh, how it impacts uh, health. So, um, so after that, basically it, it changes the way that I, I I, I'm, I'm afraid. I sometimes I'm afraid of you, you to use the word change in science because people often think that oh, like this invalidates everything we know, but that's not the case. Like it builds on what we know and it allows us to do things differently. But you know, it's 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 science is about continuously growing in knowledge and it, like there may be things that we thought used to be true that now we know that is not basically it's not the whole story. And I think that this probably uh, is true for a lot of people who do. Um, who study science in university, the first year they'll tell you, oh, this is how things are, you have to remember this. And then the second year they'll tell you, that's not quite the whole big, big picture. And every year you learn a bit more and, and you build up on this. Um, and so, uh, and I think that's what uh, what the new technology allows us to do, that basically we get a bigger picture or we see clearer picture than compared to what we we're able to do before. And so, for example, uh, we, we now, uh, we have a sequencing machine that, well, uh, let me go back a little bit to the human genome project that, that was to put together the entire sequence of the human genome, which is about 3 billion characters. And at the time, we could only sequence roughly on scale of about a thousand uh, base pairs at a time, so a thousand characters uh, at a time. That means we need to do a, around three to four million of these uh, PCR um, uh, signing sequencing experiments. Um, but now we can sequence that. Uh, we can sequence something like, uh, let me think, uh, yeah, about a billion reactions, like in, so instead of three million, that took a decade to do. Uh, now we can do that reaction uh, a billion times on a machine, on a single machine uh, in 24 hours. So that's a scale that technology has changed. Uh, and so like the, but um, what bioinformatics does is it's kind of the flip side of this, that you know, we, where we, because it generates so much data, you can't do, again, you can't do this in Excel. So we do this in using other methods. Uh, we use uh, pro, we, we use a lot of pro, uh, much larger computers to analyze the data. Um, and uh, we we look for patterns. And yes, certainly AI and machine learning is starting to play a big part in what we can do. So all this is just it changes what how we do things, and it enables us to do more. Um, and uh, and and I'm I mean I, I can say I'm always afraid that you know what I know today in five years time it's obsolete. And and you do have to constantly kind of understand what is the what is a new technology that's coming and you have to be prepared for that. And, um, but it doesn't, it really doesn't invalidate what we know before. Like it, it doesn't say that, okay, well, the knowledge from 10 years ago is, is completely wrong. We have to do everything again. That's, that, that's, not, the, that's not what I understand to be the case. Um, and so uh, I think I've drifted far away from the <laughs> questions. No, um, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, the, um both the things that are feeding into bioinformatics and the things that it's feeding into. Um, another type of technology now, Charlie, what is... He was, he was a little bit nervous before. I think he did really well. Didn't he? <laughs> um, what is blockchain? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> All right, so less, if we can no. get some pillows <laughs> and some, some sleeping bags and I'll get another five or six hours. No, just kidding. Um, so... Blockchain, I think, is one of the latest applications of a disruptive technology. Like we've all heard of the term disruptive technologies. And every time we have a disruptive technology, it changes the workforce. So it calls for different skills. It calls for some jobs to stop and some to start. So, sorry, I don't, I don't have your name. Sorry. Richie. Richie. So Richie mentioned, so in agriculture, we move from manual, manual processing of things and into machinery. We've also seen the internet. So the internet was massively disruptive. And we take it for granted now. But the people who are making money out of not using the internet before the internet came were not happy with the internet at all. 
because uh, it did a whole bunch of stuff that they did and they didn't, that wasn't great. But eventually we kind of just took it on board. And now even as um, um, Andreas is saying, we take computers complete, completely for granted, let alone the internet. The internet is just basically something that in the background that we assume is always going to be there. But once upon a time, it was a massively disruptive technology that changed everything and called for big changes in education, big changes in job preparedness, big changes in investment strategies, you know, called for a, a big overhaul in the way we see economies functioning and jobs functioning. And on a small scale, you know, we saw, you can remember a DVD, ever owning a DVD? You don't want to have a VCR? I used to watch Star Trek Enterprise on my little VCR. I think it was even a Betamax tape, you know? And now we can just push our button and literally watch just about anything that was ever recorded in high definition on our, on our big screen. So other things like coal power systems, we used to have these big, dirty old coal power systems, and now we're moving to solar panels and EVs and all this sort of stuff. Each of those bringing big, big changes to the way the system works. So blockchain is kind of, I think one of, blockchain and kind of AI go quite hand in hand um, as being one of the biggest, recent disruptive sort of technologies uh, that we're all going to have to sort of come to grips with. The theme that they sit under is what we call decentralization. It sounds pretty academic and a bit boring, but what it basically means is taking it from being something that's controlled, heavily controlled centrally, typically by a company, a corporation, with some involvement from government. Different countries have different levels, but mostly it's controlled by a corporation. And then the rest of us kind of access it. So that happened in the energy space. So even here in South Australia, we used to have two big coal plants and we'd, we'd burn our coal and we'd pump all the electrons out all to the houses and we'd buy our electricity and that was it. Now, if we wanted to build our own, get our own electricity, we have to put a diesel generator in the backyard or something, you know, and it's a bit loud and the neighbors are gonna complain. So we were pretty much stuck to, that's how we got energy. And then as the technology advanced and advanced and advanced, the first available technology for solar panels was 1968. They were commercially available. So it took, it took a long, long time because the old system hangs on for dear life. Right? So now solar panels are the biggest energy generating um, capacity in the country. In, in Perth, it's one in three houses. In South Australia, it's one in four houses. And these are small, clean technologies that enable us to be, plug them into our own houses. So we've seen both the coal plants here in South Australia close because the central model wasn't as economically viable. The next sort of dis dis decentralization is, is in advanced computing we're talking about. I, I, I pray that it stays decentralized when we talk about artificial intelligence. One of the biggest threats is that it no longer becomes a public good and it becomes it gets controlled by corporations effectively, which makes it very difficult for incumbents to or new people to, to break into existing industries. Um, one of the speakers that I was on another panel, a, a pint of science, if you ever see pint of science around, go to them, they're really cool. You have a beer and sit in the front of a pub and talk about interesting things. He said that if you're a company right now and you're not using AI in your business, it's costing you money because your competitors are. Even if it's just rewriting your media collateral using ChatGPT or doing, a, doing a, some sort of scan on a topic using some sort of software, if you're not using that right now, like the 99% of businesses aren't, the 1% that are, are, are getting a competitive advantage. And it's not particularly difficult to start using. So, so, that's, so you know, these things are moving really quickly. And it's the, hopefully it stays decentralized, which would be great. And then the third one, which I'm sort of most fascinated by, is this decentralization of trust. So right back in the, in the old days when, when the cowboys were digging up little yellow rocks and they, they didn't want the next guy next to them to blow their heads off and take their little yellow rock, they had to give it to someone to protect it. So they put a building up, they put bars on the building, they put guns and soldiers around the building and said, right, we'll look after your little yellow rocks um, and we'll, we'll provide stability for this. And that, that model has now gone you know, gone gangbusters and we've got a centralized trust system where we rely on banks and intermediaries and insurance companies and finance companies and, and governments to allow us to have trust that we can have money and we can have assets and we can have wealth and we can do different things. Um, but the downside to that is the person who owns the bank with the guns around it pretty much controls everything. And 78% of the world's worth, wealth is controlled by 1% of the world's population, which is absolutely disgusting and has massive implications, of course. So what we're lucky to have is through this sort of innovation and technology, we've got to a point now where we can actually decentralize, sorry, there's people up there, hey. <laughs> we can decentralize trust using computer and computer code. And it's actually pretty simple code. Um, in 2008, there was a, an anonymous person who, who has yet to identify themselves, put a nine page paper together on how you could put together a blockchain and just posted it on a public forum. Um, and 69 days later, to the letter, uh, launched the Bitcoin blockchain. 
which at its peak had $1.3 trillion worth of value in it, and it doesn't involve a single human being to manage it. $1.3 trillion, never hacked. No banks are involved. The US government tried to subpoena the CEO of Bitcoin and quickly realized there is no CEO of Bitcoin because there's no company. There are no humans involved. It is literally just code that lives in the internet, effectively on computers like us, like ours. People, just people like us installing it on our computer. Enough people install it on their computer and we can keep it secure. Because if mine gets hacked and all yours doesn't, mine looks different. So mine doesn't update the system. Uh, very, very simple out outline. So this sort of decentralization of trust is going to have massive, massive, massive implications for jobs and for functionality across, across all sectors and all professions, really. Um, but as, um, as Andreas was saying, there's no big bang. It's a slow, slow burn. Things move slowly. So we move slowly with solar panels. You probably, some of you in the room may even were like really early adopters and it felt like years and years and years and years when there was just one or two and then suddenly everyone's putting up solar panels and then now, now we've got, we're starting to get batteries on houses and house level batteries and now we're moving into electric vehicles. And electric vehicles have been around. The first cars were electric vehicles about a hundred years ago, but now we've just started to get to the point where the majority of all, all the car makers are all make electric vehicles and computer companies are now making EVs and competing with the old motor companies. You know, they, they call themselves motor companies as well, you know, Ford Motor Company and the whole motor company. It was all about the engine, where now it's all about the technology. So things are moving really quickly. Um, we also saw an AI, like AI used to just be something that was in the, it was a context for a, for a movie, you know, in, in, in Hollywood. And, you know, this is going to happen and all this stuff is going to, like you were saying before, it's going to take over and, you know, Skynet and all the rest of it. Um, and then ChatGPT was released, which sent a flare up into the, into, the, into the world and said, hey, this functionality is here and it's astoundingly useful in our world, which is heavily language-based. So it's a language learning um, platform that helps us to write and to conceive and to, and to bring together knowledge into ways that we can understand it. Um, and that, that really happened, it's, it's happened this year, right? It's happened uh, overnight, effectively, um, from something that people are like, oh yeah, we won't ever need to use that. That's not a sort of, that's not a thing. The themes that we've heard of previous waves of innovation, the same sort of things getting said um, are now being said about AI. So those that are early to lead are the ones that take the benefits and those who not, who aren't, they follow. And that happens with any, any sort of change. And the tough thing we're going to find is that our, our mechanism for preparing people for the workforce, sort of our university system, our TAFE system, like the minister was saying, our vocational learning system, our, um, all, all the systems that prepare us, for, for, for some good reasons, lag behind what the latest is in that, in that sector or in that workplace. But I think we're going to find that the, the, the size of the lag is, is just too big. And we have to figure out ways to shorten that really quickly. Like typically some, in academic circles, we sort of say we're about 15 years behind advanced practice. Like some engineering programs in the country talk a little bit about renewables. They're definitely not talking much about EVs yet. And we're sort of waiting, it, waiting for it to get proven out in the industry, waiting for you know, grant funding to come up with the certain keywords in it. Like there's a process where it slowly kind of comes along. And when it's, when, when it's really well established, then it's okay to say, okay, we'll start to add a little bit into our program, but our programs are already full. But of course they're full because you can't offer an incomplete program, but that's typically the first thing you hear when you want to put something new into a program. Oh, well, it's already full. It's like, well, there's some stuff that needs to kind of move out and there's some stuff that needs to move in. But my understanding is, um, so I'm, I work in and out of industry and academia and consulting and wherever fun projects exist. And my experience is that university lecturers, I don't know about you guys, and I'm not saying anything about the University of Adelaide, University of Adelaide is fantastic and we love it. <laughs> um, more support could be given to academics to understand how to bring in this new stuff into their content because it can actually be pretty scary. Like if you've been teaching something for quite a long time, like you're a finance professor and you've been teaching the fiat system, like the current financial system, and now we're moving to an intermediary free digital currency that's non-sovereign and keeps an immutable record of transactions from the day the database was launched all the way up to today that can be searched. It's just so different to the system that we've got. There's a tendency to say, well, hang on, I'm going to wait until that is completely proven before I even put my head in that pond and try and figure that out because it's, it's, it's scary, right? It's, it's a massive change. But particularly in Australia, if we are going to be at the forefront of innovative technologies, if we're going to move away from a reliance on, on selling things we dig out of the ground, 
we're going to have to quickly move with the pace of the technology and pace of the disruption and figure out how to add value in that area. So just a final comment, when, when, we, when we look across sort of accounting and lawyers and finance and different things to try and look at their professional bodies, like what are their reports saying about blockchain? And, and they're all saying, yes, blockchain is going to do a lot of things a lot easier and a lot quicker than we're currently doing them using, using human systems and sort of iterative systems, a lot of paper-based systems, a lot of independent, independent systems connected to each other rather than just putting them all in a trusted platform. But like Andreas says, rather than getting worried about that, we need to keep our eyes focused on how can we add more value? So we're not necessarily doing the, the digital um, routine tasks. The, the computer systems can do that, but how can we then do the next sort of level? And, and I was, as I was listening to the speakers this morning, I think there's sort of three, three areas. Of, uh, firstly, for me, safe, inclusive, and loving families is the first thing we should all be doing with our time. If we, if we can do that, we've completely lost that focus in our society and the tools to do that are, are very elusive and you have to kind of go and get them yourselves. I highly recommend you do that. Um, but the second one is just collaborating and for learning and for, for delivering and creating things. Um, like, um, like the minister was saying, how do, we, how do we all come together? How do, we, how do we create learning environments? How do we create innovative environments? How do we bring people on board so we can move quicker? I mean, the computers are going to be able to support us to do that, but we're really good at connecting with each other, finding things that connect us, and then getting ourselves involved in things that inspire us. And then the last one is interpreting the advice of the, of the system, you know, making sense, this idea of making sense. How can we, you know, so go, to, go into an AI device and say, right, here, here, is, here are my three annual reports for the last five years or, or whatever. Um, give me the top three strategies that you think my company should take. And it's going to look at that and it's going to look at everything else it can find on the internet. And literally before your eyes, it's going to write you a strategy, which is about 80% on, on the money, right? So it's not going to then go and implement that for you. It's also not going to know the local context. It's not going to know the context of your of your communities, of your people, of, of the people that are involved, like the access to things. So it'll always need an interpretation. It'll always need you to bring to life what the data shows us and what the information and how the information can be put together into stories. So I was really good at creating stories, how that can be implemented through collaborating with each other and helping each other to move forward. Thank you. Um, so we have some time for audience questions now. We're going to have a roving microphone. So if anyone's got some questions, feel free to put your hand up and someone will be coming to you. While we wait for that, I first had a question um, for Ruchi on mm. job titles. I believe you have a few ideas for things that people might work as in 10 years. Yes, I have quite a few. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at my notes because I made up these titles. So my first future job title is a crop whisperer going to be an agriculture specialist who knows automation and precision techniques so has been trained in that technical skill but does uh, data-driven farming so is basically the person who can be the interface between the plant and the data that comes from AI and agriculture so a crop whisperer there's going to be a data Jedi and an AI sorcerer this is a person who's a master of data processing and analysis, understands machine learning, advanced computing, a little bit working with Paul right now, um, and make these magical decisions and is generalist enough to apply those decisions across sectors. I'm going to have a tech visit, I think, of a blue collar bliss. This is my name, don't ask me why. Um, who's going to be able to blend traditional trades, so manual labor with supervised robots. So this is the person who can optimize the robotics. So their job would be like, you know, make a 15th arm in this robot because that's more efficient. Um, as a psychologist, I think they're going to be emotional gurus. These are people who are adept at understanding emotional communication and translating that not just between humans, but between machines and humans. So um, there's a lot already. We wear these Apple watches that know our blood pressure, galvanic skin response. Um, Amazon is already trying to make movies that are going to be customized to your emotional state in the moment. So if you want to feel, you know, sad about or romantic, it can actually change the script of the movie because it's AI actors based on your current blood pressure. So um, we'll need people who are psychologists, who understand human intelligence, emotions, and so forth. Um, a few more. Um, I, I do think a lot of consultant lawmakers, judges, lawyers, regulators, 
we'll have to start going back to philosophy and ethics. Um, that's where um, one of the big things with AI and machine learning, and I'm focusing more on that, is I'm interested in the human intelligence and what happens when there is a super intelligence that makes us feel a little less intelligent every day. Um, where are we going to find that meaning and significance? I think we're going to find that meaning and significance by deciding the moral compass of where society goes and what organizations do or what jobs should be like. So um, I can imagine a lot of jobs in the future, which will be lawyers who ask those difficult questions on what will happen, what would be the basic livelihood for people, how we, should we have universal basic income, um, how do we provide meaning, and what areas of jobs should we keep and, and adopt a protectionist perspective where we won't let AI come in, because this is what gives humans most meaning. And what is the drudgery where we will let AI come in or machine or automation come in? Um, and then I think there's one set of jobs for all of us who can become um, naturally human workers where we never use technology. We start writing letters with ink in real paper, <laughs> never relying on chat GPT. I think that's going to be like a luxury good. <laughs> As someone who works in a building with a turret and a moat, I love the idea of a professional sorcerer. That yeah. feels very thematically appropriate. Okay. So, um, can I you... just make a comment? Yeah. I think that um, uh, I feel like there's also a question of like trust with mm. AIs because yeah. uh, we often hear about that. Okay, these days, or well, you can train AIs that can make better or faster diagnosis, medical mm -hmm. diagnosis than than human doctors can. Um, but the problem it always comes back to trust, like. Right? Mm. How, how do you trust this? And just, just on that, the reason why we aren't able to trust this is because we don't understand how it comes to those. A lot of machine learning and AI, it gives us really reliable, predictable, really good accuracy data, but we don't know how it came to that decision. So I think that's going to be a huge problem the minute we create any super intelligent entity that we don't have the intelligence to understand mm then we have only two options. We rely on it like Google Maps or we don't because we just say, no, I trust my intelligence over an intelligence I don't understand. And I think it's like you said, sometimes it goes back, you have to go back to ethics and mm -hmm. philosophy and maybe for easy questions, like, you know, it's easy to say, okay, well, you know, maybe the AI makes decisions about breakfast for you, yeah. but it, it, it could be much bigger, much more important decisions. and. And and you, know, you don't know what are the basis on which the AI made those decisions or recommendations, and and so I I think that's like a, a big question for for the future. I have a ten year old, and that's the last one I say. I have a ten year old, and as a parent, I worry. I was like, what am, what am I teaching her? So right now, she goes to a public school, and it's numeracy and literacy, right? At schooling, primary school is about teaching basic numeracy, which at this stage is pattern recognition doing some addition, division, multiplication, and learning how to read and write. Um, but I'm already trying to convince my daughter to become an AI ethicist. <laughs> I feel like one job I can assure you <laughs> for the next 20, 40 years. After that, I'm not trying to predict. Sorry. Um, question from the audience down here. So this has been a really interesting conversation, and I'm a policy person. So I want to throw the, like, with all the things that have been discussed here, a lot of this also stems to how do we shape that future of jobs? Well, it really depends on the politicians and how they even highlight um, what these jobs are. And they keep on throwing the words like AI, robotics, and quantum. And, and then um, there's so, as, as you know, we've given examples, they're so generic that it doesn't really narrow down anything. Um, and I'm not sure if all these politicians actually understand um, exactly what they're saying on stage. So how do we better even educate the needs of society when when um politicians are saying we we need we need these really high level skill sets and then and then we are still working that typical nine to five job where we were coming from that automated society so i'd love to explore that topic i'm happy to just take it two seconds because i agree with charlie that the lag is too huge and um I was born in India, studied in the US, and I've lived in Australia. I'm not, and I can't say everything about all the world, um, world stance or government stance, but I know that Europe is far more protectionist right now with changing AI and letting it entering its industries. Um, most countries that have huge 
human right background of welfare state and and protecting of worker rights are going to have a longer lag because they are going to be more protectionist of the systems that work right now. And so I think I'm not answering your question, but I'm trying to say is there is a cultural background to the history of country. Wow. And they that's are true. kind and, of catch yeah. 22, right? Because if they're trying to slow adoption of something to protect their old thing, yes. rather than saying, let's use the new thing, but make sure everybody benefits. Mm -hmm. But the protectionism is the basis of that society because it's been running, Oof. the history has been running regulation policy. Welfare state is about protecting the worker, right? So even if you look at all the enterprise agreements that have been signed with all corporations and governments in, in Australia, it's far more protectionist. Universities are being protectionist about academics. We are telling, don't tell your, don't allow your students to use chat GPT. Why not? At this stage, if you if you allow them to use it, it's responsibilities on the academics to ask a question that is beyond what a chat GPT can answer. So I do think my thing is the best thing you can do is to not try and be a protectionist as a policymaker, but but innovate and find future ways of egalitarian resources. So stop at that. Um, actually, on that, we have a question that was sent in um, beforehand by Ben, who, are you here? Hello. <laughs> um, uh, which I think is related. Uh, can you foresee any unique challenges and opportunities faced by various demographic groups in the workforce, such as young people, people with disabilities, and older workers? Um, I imagine, yeah, you would have a perspective on that, possibly Andreas as well. Um, does that relate to artificial intelligence or in general? That question has been around for a while and it's a, it's a difficult, difficult one to, to answer. I mean, if, you're, if we're talking about um, new technologies in general, um, there, there's going to be people who can adjust quickly and, and, uh, to these and, and want to adjust and want to learn from them and those uh, 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 and work with those new technologies. Mm. And there may be others that, that uh, find it more challenging and um, uh, are generally perhaps opposed to that. Uh, it, the, the difference that may be on, on this occasion that the AIs that are being produced, um, because we, we don't assume we need to understand how they're doing things, mm. they're actually pretty easy to use. So um, uh, they're, they're, in, in theory, they may actually be able uh, much more accessible to all populations, mm. people with disability, older people, as well as young people, um, than, than other technologies uh, were in the past where you mm. needed to learn how to switch on mm. a computer, which wasn't straightforward in the early days. No, mm. they, just all you need to do is flip this thing open and it's running. Um, and, and many people, you know, including my dad, find it rather, rather difficult to get used to that. So they're, 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 they're those sort of um, uh, uh, op opportunities. Um, I'm I'm working on the basis that, and that goes back to the, the previous question, perhaps that the uh, much of the the hard stuff, the hard AI, the blockchain stuff that's going to be there, there'll be a hardcore of people who know how to do these things. And and while there's talk about we need we need uh, more STEM graduates, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, you know we're going to end up without the electrician and without the plumber and without the doctor, etc. Et if you focus too much much on that. Um, the um, uh, we don't all need to know how how a technology works in detail. For most cases, mm -hmm. you know, we don't know whether combust how a combustion engine uh, works at present. We know it does work when you turn the key or press the button, um, and and that that will largely remain to, to, to be the case. The, the, in terms of um, going back to the question about you know, opportunities and, and challenges. I, I, um, I've done a bit bit of work with um, with and about young people and how they enter into the labour market, and I think they're actually um, um, in a, in a very privileged position at this point in time because of the the history of um, being immersed with technology mm -hmm. already, and also how they're picking their jobs. They're actually moving into the kind of jobs without being told um, that. Um, everyone else predicts to be the, the ones, uh, the jobs of the future, the, 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 the jobs that will utilize the new technology and build on, on, on that, that technology. Now, in part, young people doing this because 
the other jobs are disappearing, so they can't go to them. But we are also spending more time in ed education. Um, and uh, um, that inevitably, almost inevitably, leads you in, into, into an area where um, the, the technology and perhaps even the, the wider economic growth is, is currently expected. Is that a, a point to that? Um, I think, I don't know, Ben, if that was your emphasis, but you mentioned young, aging, and the people with disability. And I think, for me, those are all vulnerable groups, right? So they, they are considered minorities or they're considered vulnerable because they are a smaller population. They're, they're considered by the economy or governments or society to be less productive and therefore are valued less and so forth. Um, my view on how any of this technology is, um, it's it will level the playing field, as you mentioned, for a lot of things. It'll make, um, just like remote work levels the field about global labor markets. You don't have to necessarily be a local to employ people. Um, you'll have disabilities become less of an issue if, if they can work remotely. Um, but at the same time, we'll find hierarchies to sort ourselves in again. And but they might be hierarchies, as Charlie said, is that I don't think technology is going to take jobs away from humans. I think humans who use technology are going to take jobs away from other humans. So um, and so that's always going to be playing with the most vulnerable population might change, but there will be a vulnerable population, the ones who are not curious to learn the change. Just a quick comment. I find it quite an interesting question. While I was listening, I don't know, I have any background in this topic area, but I actually saw that. So young people, older people, and disabled people are actually ideal early adopters. Because mm -hmm. young people, like you're saying, Andreas, are evolve, evolve with this sort of technology. They're already well ahead of the curve. I mean, in high school, I was saying before, there was one computer at my high school that kept the contact details for the parents because you could update it. Right? And the, you know, my, my daughter's 12 and on her phone, she can access pretty much anything, anything she wants. Right? And then you've got the, the older people who now are out of their roles. So they're much more likely to be interested. I do a lot of talks to provost groups and retired groups, fascinating conversations, because they're no longer attached to the way they were doing things in their workplace. So I think the people who are going to really struggle are the 50 to 60 year olds that have spent 20, 20, 30 years doing something a certain way and presented with evidence that that way is going to change really quickly, maybe even before they retire. And they're just going to have, to have no clue how to, how to navigate that. Indeed, I know a professor of literature who saw ChatGPT coming and decided to retire early, kind of in his early 60s, because he went, this is not something I want to spend the rest of my career learning to deal with. I think it's understandable. Yeah. Um, that is all we have time for. Um, do we want to do one more question? All right. Um, if we've got another question, we might head um, take it. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, we're, with uh, AI and chat GPT and everything like that, how, how do we see that kind of going forward with the workforce and having um, kind of uh, employee engagement and satisfaction in your job? Because obviously there's the two opposite things of having like an assistant that you can go to to get all of the help or feeling like you aren't actually doing any of the work. Well, there's been a lot of drudgery that knowledge workers have never accepted, or we never talk about a managerial job where you spend eight hours running some numbers in an Excel sheet, you know, so I think that's where I think I'm the most scared about is the the loss of our sense of identity of what our value is. Um, a lot of jobs are going to get outsourced, or at least leaner workforces will be required for administration, planning, data, you know, structuring, reports, getting a few things. Um, and I think the the engagement that we can you we can create in job to give people a sense of meaning and significance will have to come from compassion, helping, assisting, mentoring. Um, and then you efficiently finish your job, but you also create a community that others want to come in and do. But I, I think this idea that we're going to have as many knowledge workers as we have today, 10 years from now, is not going to be the state in my view at all. Because knowledge, there's a lot of drudgery in knowledge work that have been paid big bucks for that drudgery, and that's going to get replaced. So, that there, so I predict some of us will go back 
to not putting knowledge workers on those ivory towers that they had come and not feeling threatened by robots and machines. Uh, we'll have to find other ways of contributing to society. And there are other ways of contributing to society than working on Excel sheets. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, so we've run a little bit over time. Um, I'd like you all to thank, um, join me in thanking our guest speakers for today. Um, I'd also like to thank Inspiring South Australia, who's provided us support to us with support to run these events. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming along. Um, it's really great to have an audience for these. The next session of Cosmos Science City will be on the 3rd of October and the topic's going to be cancer. Um, and I'd also just like to briefly draw your attention to this mysterious veiled thing on this wall over here. That's the cover of our next magazine. It's the 100th edition of Cosmos. It's coming out next week. And in two weeks time, we're gonna, we're gonna have an unveiling of the artwork that's been done for the cover. You would have seen um, earlier uh, a time-lapse of it being painted. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Make sure you're on our mailing lists if you wanna see what it looks like. Um, but other than that, thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>